This video is sponsored by Film Convert. You know, that first detonation of the atomic bomb must have been one of the most hypnotic and terrifying things. A lot of us ended up looking like the characters. Without... Worryingly. Yeah, but yeah, worryingly. It started a chain reaction that would destroy the world. That just seemed like the most incredible moment in time to take the audience to be in that room with them. Another Christopher Nolan film is finally here. After what was a fairly muted premiere of his last film, Tenet, during the pandemic, the hype has been mounting for the release of Oppenheimer and the story of creating the atomic bomb. This movie is set to be explosive, with Nolan saying that he wants you to experience the power of this world-changing weapon personally. But the atomic bomb isn't the only thing that was explosive about this film's production. From a falling out with Warner Brothers, to Barbenheimer, to the actor strike starting at the premiere of the movie, it's anything but ordinary. This fascinating production is made even more interesting for the story it tells about humanity creating something devastating they couldn't put back in a box, while at the same time actors and writers are striking over AI, a human construct Nolan likens to the creation of the atomic bomb. This is a moment of history that is a moment of truth. They literally refer to this right now as their Oppenheimer moment. They're looking to his story to say, okay, what are the responsibilities? Developing new technologies that may have unintended consequences. So join us and put on some sunglasses as we peer into the atomic explosion of Oppenheimer. We are better to begin this story than at the end of Tenet's production in November 2019, where Nolan's interest in Oppenheimer manifested a good time ahead of putting pen to paper for a new film. The interest presented itself for the first time in Tenet in the form of a discussion surrounding the film's MacGuffin named The Algorithm and The Grandfather Paradox. One camp of future scientists believed that the use of the algorithm would mean the end of reality, while another camp of people believed that the algorithm would bring certain destruction. One of these scientists was the Oppenheimer of that generation, and unlike him, she decided to sabotage the algorithm, deconstructing and hiding it in various locations in the past. You're familiar with the Manhattan Project? As they approached the first atomic test, Oppenheimer became concerned that the detonation might produce a chain reaction. Think of our scientist as her generation's Oppenheimer. These references to Oppenheimer really captivated Nolan, and one of the film's major stars, Robert Pattinson, further planted the seed in Nolan's head by giving him an unusual gift, a collection of speeches from Oppenheimer himself. Nolan later said in an interview that he started to get very excited about rather than using Oppenheimer as an analogy in a science fiction sense, telling the actual reality of the story. And he tied this fascination with Oppenheimer's story to his own experience growing up in the Cold War era, where the threat of nuclear war and global conflict still felt very real. Nolan found himself curious as to how this threat and the technology behind it came to be, even comparing the concept of Oppenheimer to his previous film, Batman Begins, an origin story, just for a very different subject matter. So he began to write. Now it is interesting to point out that Nolan has a different approach to writing a script, a somewhat abstract way you could say. He describes it as, there's a geometry or geography, I think in very geographical terms, or geometric terms about structures and patterns. Over the years I've tried adopting a sort of ground up approach to structure, but ultimately it's very much an instinctive process. Does the feeling have the shape of a narrative, and how does that come together? And interestingly enough, this movie shares some similarities with Memento, in that the film features both color film and black and white film. And in an interview with The Lord Lewis Show, no one demonstrated on a chalkboard how he views a story structure and timeline. Okay, it's confusing because I don't think pictorially, diagrammatically. So, okay, what do you have? You have the beginning of the film here. Best way to draw it is as a hairpin, like that. That's basically the end of the movie. This stuff is the black and white stuff. This is color, and this is running backwards as a series of jumps. And what we do is we cut between the two the whole way through. So we alternate scene here, scene there, scene there, scene there, scene there, scene there, scene there, and they meet towards the end of the film. But then within this, you have flashbacks to a different timeline, which is actually even earlier, somewhere around there. Also within this, you have flashbacks to an earlier time, also somewhere within there. For Oppenheimer, Nolan did mention that he did approach the script in a way that he's never written before, saying, in the case of this film, I wrote the script in the first person. 
It's the only time I've done that. It made it clear to anyone who read the script that we're on this ride with Oppenheimer. As he wrapped up writing the script, it was time to put the cast together, and he had just the person in mind to play Oppenheimer, an actor who had been with him since seemingly the beginning of his career, Killian Murphy. In September 2020, Nolan would fly to Ireland to hand deliver the Oppenheimer script to Killian Murphy. But why fly and not just email the script? Well, Christopher Nolan doesn't actually have his own email, or even carry a smartphone, instead leaving that to his assistant to handle all emails. In fact, this might be part of the reason why his scripts never seem to get leaked or spoiled, because everything is delivered physically and not through a digital way, it would seem. Killian Murphy would accept the role and go on to later say that it was the best script that he had ever read. Nolan would also bring on Robert Downey Jr., Matt Damon, and Emily Blunt, who all took pay cuts to work on this movie, earning $4 million each instead of their usual $10 to $20 million to be in this film. With the script and cast set, it was almost time to start production. In 2020, Warner Brothers decided to release the film Wonder Woman 84 on HBO Max the same day as its theater release due to the impact of COVID, and they announced that they would be doing the same thing for all of their 2021 releases. Crucially, they took this decision without consulting the filmmakers themselves, and this caused a lot of frustration because inevitably, having a release on streaming platforms the same day as the theatrical release would discourage some people from watching these releases on the big screen instead. Of at home. In an interview with Entertainment Tonight, Nolan blasted Warner Brothers' decision as a real bait and switch. There's such controversy around it because they didn't tell anyone. In 2021, they've got some of the top filmmakers in the world, they've got some of the biggest stars in the world who have worked for years in some cases on these projects very close to their hearts that are meant to be big screen experiences, they're meant to be out there for the widest possible audiences, the, the sort of uh, A release, uh, and now they're being used as a lost leader for the streaming service, for the fledgling streaming service, um, without any consultation or any, so it's really unfortunate. It's it's not the way to do business and uh, it's it's not the best thing for the, for the health of our industry. And this mismanagement prompted him to look elsewhere for the making of Oppenheimer. In the process of finding a new distributor, there were quite a few contenders, including Paramount, Sony, Apple, and Universal. Many of these contenders were keen on the film, but struggled to meet Nolan's needs for the theatrical release, with Apple struggling to commit to the window Nolan was looking for, and Paramount switching focus more towards streaming. But Universal, according to one insider quoted by The Hollywood Report, simply said yes, and that got them the role. And it's easy to see why. Unlike Warner Brothers, who dropped theatrical prominence in favor of streaming, Universal had doubled down on theatrical, agreeing to offer exclusive theatrical windows to the films they released, with 31 days of exclusivity. And it seemed to work well with how no one wanted this film to be distributed. Now that they finally had a distribution agreement in place, it was time to start filming. Filming would start in January 2022, and most of the principal filming would take place in the desert in New Mexico. And almost just like all of the scientists they gathered in secret to build an atomic bomb, the crew all stayed in the same hotel, which was the only one around the area, and they all ate at the only restaurant in the area, mentioning it was like summer camp with a lot of margaritas. Interestingly enough, Killian Murphy actually kept himself and missed out on the dinners because of the diet he was on for the film, reportedly only eating a handful of almonds or a slice of an apple at night as he lost weight for the role, presumably to portray the extreme stress and mental anguish of Oppenheimer in that moment. Emily Blunt mentioned to People's Magazine that the sheer volume of what he had to take on and shoulder is so monumental. Of course, he didn't want to have to come and have dinner with us. Now, getting on to the practical filming of Oppenheimer, it features a rather special film process. Black and white scenes shot on IMAX. It is a format that was never seen in a movie before and was custom ordered from Eastman Kodak, who were able to create and deliver these special film reels for the movie's production. Kodak also has a surprising history with nuclear bombs, so if you want to find out more about that and Kodak's special IMAX black and white film, you can watch our other video that we link to in the description. And while it is preferable to use film for a movie, that's not necessarily a luxury all of us can afford or that even makes sense in a workflow situation. I mean, IMAX film stock costs around two to three dollars a foot to buy and process. And considering Oppenheimer's 15 per 70 millimeter film final cut film reel is close to 11 miles long or around 50,000 plus feet. Yeah, I don't think many of us have a couple hundred thousand dollars laying around to spend on film or even maybe have the patience for it to process. 
For me, this is really where I use our sponsor, Film Converts Film Emulation Software. In fact, you may have noticed it throughout this video as 60 to 70% of the video has Film Converts Film Emulation used throughout. Adding Film Converts Film Emulation to photos and low resolution videos actually helps to soften up some of the digital tearing and even gives it a nice film look at the same time. Now, I use it in a weird way, but there are plenty of other ways to use it on actual footage that you take and use. And there are also other awesome film convert programs like Cinematch, which helps you to match looks between different camera sensors, which is a lifesaver as a video editor. Be sure to check out those links below and use the code Voyager to get 10% off on all film convert products. But really, however novel the black and white IMAX look is, certain scenes just require a spectrum of colors, especially the mesmerizing yet terrifying recreations of an atomic blast. Instead of making use of various particle simulations and fluid dynamics, Christopher Nolan wanted to capture the destructive force of the nuclear bomb on film, capturing real sparks and fire and the turbulent winds of the most destructive weapon on Earth. There were certain challenges in place in regard to filming these explosions. The cameras needed to be shielded from debris and heat, and the correct film stock had to be used in order to prevent the entire sequence from being overexposed. Small enough for the pyrotechnics to not injure anyone and to be controlled enough for the camera crew to film, but also big enough for the explosion to not appear as small, preventing the so-called dollhouse effect from happening, or in other words, preventing the viewers from knowing that the explosion was a miniature. Luckily, we did get insight into the explosions from Scott R. Fisher, the effects supervisor of Oppenheimer. In an interview from Slash Film, he explained that the majority of the explosive mixture was composed of gasoline and propane, with other substances being mixed into this flammable cocktail, specifically magnesium and aluminum powder. Nolan envisioned these effects from a non-CGI standpoint. But describing what would essentially be a big a -cher. A funny special effects term that essentially describes a big miniature. Scott Fisher wasn't the only person that Christopher Nolan took on board. Andrew Jackson also was recruited from the start. A VFX supervisor from Double Negative who previously worked on Nolan's Tenant and Dunkirk and other films that included a whole bunch of explosions, namely Mad Max Fury Road. According to Jackson, Nolan recruited him onto the team thanks to a demolition heavy demo reel, showcasing various explosions Jackson worked on and asking the director if any of the demonstrated effects interested him. It turned out that the footage spoke for itself, and Andrew Jackson expressed that he had great joy in brainstorming what a nuclear explosion could look like, which is a slightly concerning thing to say. Coming back to the explosive compounds, gasoline and propane obviously were used for igniting the explosive mixture. Aluminum and magnesium, on the other hand, played a role significantly brightening it up. In powdered form, both metals burn a bright white, to the point where the light created from the ignited powders could even damage your eyesight if you looked at it for too long. And this burns in air very easily and gives out a lot of energy, form of light and heat, uh, but a brilliant white light. So you can see this here, bring the lights down please. So a brilliant white light as the magnesium reacts with the oxygen from the air. With the magnesium's bright flash and the aluminum's bright white sparks, Scott Fisher and Andrew Jackson were able to achieve a simulation of what a nuclear blast and physics happening within it could look like. It's kind of back to the old days. We did a lot of experimentation. We came up with some very interesting analog methods of how to approach this, all of which was leading to the Trinity test. Aside from the bigotures, the effects team might also have filmed smaller sparks, light streaks, dust clouds, and explosions in a smaller lab-like setting, with many scenes featuring a dark backdrop and the effect seemingly being filmed up close. However, we found a peculiar little detail in one of the more recent featurettes. While a trucker is filling up a barrel with what we presume is gasoline, in the background we spotted a Sony Pictures Studios logo on a truck, which wasn't blurred out or otherwise hidden from view, which made us question what exactly Sony's involvement in the production of Oppenheimer was, especially considering this video was one that was put out by Universal Studios. As we previously presented, Sony was one of a handful of companies that fought over a deal with the picky and demanding Christopher Nolan. However, Sony, just like Apple and Paramount, was not able to convince the director to sign a deal with them. So why is a Sony branded vehicle delivering gallons worth of gasoline to the Universal funded set? 
us this was an intriguing question, so we decided to look into Sony Pictures Studios, and what we found was an interesting rentals and expendables service, which Sony Pictures Studios offers anything from facility and theater rentals to a variety of costumes to choose from and an expansive catalog of anything a filmmaker could need, with it not only featuring gaff tape, lights, and gels, but also various tools, solvents, and metals. In a catalog, we could find benzene and kerosene for sale, together with aluminum leaves and a variety of safety equipment that must have been useful for the crew as well, which makes us believe that Nolan contracted this rental and expendable service in order to recreate the atomic blast in this film in some sort of way. So even though Sony didn't get that big deal they hoped for, they at least did end up contributing towards the production of Oppenheimer, or so it would seem. One last interesting bit of movie trivia is that Nolan had his daughter act for this movie as a girl who essentially gets her face melted off by a nuclear explosion. Nolan simply explains this decision by saying, truthfully, I try not to analyze my own intentions. So yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Finally, principal filming would end in May 2022, and the teaser trailer for the movie would be released in the summer of 2022, with an interesting countdown clock that many assumed was a countdown to the release of the movie. They even got a billboard to count down for the entire time, but it actually was not for the movie, but a countdown to the exact moment on July 16th, 1945, when the first Trinity test was triggered. A fascinating piece of marketing. All of this led up, of course, to July 13th, 2023, for Oppenheimer's premiere in the UK that came at a pivotal time for the industry that had actually nothing to do with the movie itself. Dramatically, in this premiere, the cast decided to walk out and stop promoting the film after the red carpet. This was due to the strike action announced by the Hollywood Actors Union, the Screen Actors Guild, designed to bring Hollywood to a halt. In a speech after the walkout, Christopher Nolan offered his support. It was, it was a bittersweet moment. I mean, we were all there. We were very fortunate. We had the opportunity to somewhat, you know, celebrate the film. The actors were all there to support. Uh, but then when the time came, they had to down tools and, and go off in support of all of their fellow actors and in support of the writers as well. It's, it's an important moment in the industry. Uh, the business models have been rewritten by the companies we work for, and it's time to rewrite the deals. And uh, hopefully, um, with everybody unified, that can happen as quickly as possible. And given that Nolan is a member of the Writers Guild who began striking based on similar issues to the actors a few months ago, it's not surprising that Nolan gave his full support for strikes and his cast. But it's important to note that the strike wasn't calling for audiences to boycott screenings. In fact, sometimes advocating the exact opposite approach, encouraging audiences to keep going to the movies. And thankfully, despite the strike killing off any cast promos, Oppenheimer had a unique social media craze going around to help boost its reach and interest. Barbenheimer. As most of you probably know by now, it turned out that Barbie and Oppenheimer were set to release on the same weekend, with some speculating that Warner Brothers had scheduled Barbie's release to be on the same day as Oppenheimer as their way of getting back at Nolan for dropping them. And Nolan was reportedly very frustrated with this, trying to get Barbie's release date moved away from Oppenheimer's, but Warner Brothers refused to budge. But in an ironic twist of fate, the phenomenon might actually have helped Oppenheimer a bit, as the radical contrast between Barbie's bright pink comedy aesthetic and Oppenheimer's black and white drama pushed audiences to make lots of memes, clashing the two and encouraging audiences to see both movies together. And even Nolan agrees that this is a good thing for cinema, for people to be excited and for so many big movies to be coming out this summer. Though, of course, we'll see whether or not that happens next year. The other thing to note here is that to optimally see this film, how Christopher Nolan designed it, to be seen is at one of only 30 IMAX 70 millimeter theaters around the world. And let us know if you got to see it in 70 millimeter IMAX in the comments below. It's truly quite an impressive movie and one that no one flexes his practical effects muscles in. Which speaking of practical effects, you should check out our other video on Christopher Nolan's world of practical effects here. We even have a theme song for it. <laughs> 